Welcome to episode 23 of the Necronama.com. Normally, I would do a little intro here, but I'll be honest, I'm a little scared that World War III is going to break out, and I don't want you to miss any time with Alan Baxter. So let's get straight into this. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now. And as far as I know, I'm still human. But after this podcast, who knows? (laughs) And I'm Don Guillory, historian, author, educator, uh, co-host of this podcast. And yeah, last time I checked, I was human, but uh, the blood samples came out a little weird. So I'm not sure. I'm going to tie you to the couch. All right. So... Today, we have a guest I've been eagerly anticipating. Author Alan Baxter is here. Alan, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, sure thing. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Alan Baxter. I'm a horror and dark fantasy and crime author. Um, and I don't think I've ever been human. Oh, wow. Good for you. It's, it's really, it's not as great as people make it out to be. Yeah, especially it, right? recently. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Alan, tell me about some of your books. What's your uh, latest one? Uh, my my latest is a is my second short story collection, actually called Surf Cold. Um, I had a short story collection called Crow Shine, published in twenty sixteen. Uh, that was my award winning book. I won an Australian Shadows Award for that. Nice. Um, and so now, three three years later, uh, Graham Matter Press approached me about a second collection. Uh, so that's just come out a couple of months ago. That's Surf Cold, uh, and my previous novel before that was also with Grey Matter Press, and that's uh, a sort of London crime horror called Devouring Dark that came out um, at the end of last year. So yeah, those, those are my, that's my latest stuff. I've got about, uh, I've got sort of seven or eight novels and a couple of collections and a few novellas and stuff like that out there nowadays. So building a bit of a backlist. Very cool. Awesome. And uh, where can we find you online for anybody that wants to just stop listening to me right now and just run to get your stuff? No. Hopefully they don't. Do um, no, let's, let's at least listen to the end and then run and get it. Although if it's a choice of listening or getting it, just run and get it. Um, <laughs> the best place is my my website. Is uh, you can just find that by looking up warriorscribe.com. Just one word, warriorscribe.com. Um, and you can find me on Twitter just under my name, A L A N B A X T E R. Um, those are the two easiest places to track me down. And there's a the, you know if you find me on Twitter, there's a link in my bio, all that stuff. So yeah, very cool. All right, so I don't know if our listeners know this, but I usually let the guest pick whatever we're going to talk about. So why did you pick The Thing? I was stunned that it hadn't already been picked, to be honest. Um, it's, it's, one of those, it's one of those movies, and we're talking about the, uh, the 82 John Carpenter thing in particular. Uh, I haven't actually seen the, the recent remake, um, but it's just one of, those, it's one of those seminal horror films. You guarantee it will... And any list of, you know, 100 best horror films or 10 films to see before you die, all that sort of stuff, it'll always come up on there um, because it is just such an outstanding piece of work. And at the time, it was groundbreaking and and it still stands up to this day, even though, you know, the uh, animatronic effects and stuff are a little more obvious now than perhaps they were back then. Um, in some ways, I prefer it to CGI that looks just so slick, it's hard to tell whether it's real or not. Um, but the film itself, it just stands up. It's just, it's just a fantastic study of, um, of isolation and, and just body horror and all those, all those great things that, that tend to, to make a, a great story are, are crammed in it. It's, just, it's one of the best films, regardless horror or otherwise. I think it's one of, the, one of the best films of the last century. I agree. So I don't know about you, Don, but I hadn't rewatched this in probably almost 10 years. So I was... Like as I'm watching it, I really noticed exactly what Alan's talking about mm-hmm. here. Where like some of the stuff, yeah, it looks a little hokey, but I realized how much more I like that over CGI. Do you feel that way too, or not? Uh, definitely, uh, definitely. As far as with noticing it and feeling more comfortable with this, as opposed to uh, you know whatever device they would have used to capture everybody's attention, say, "Hey, look at here," because this is where the monster's going to be. Uh, when you've got the the, the puppetry and the, and the special effects that are right there in front of them, it 
the the reaction seems a little bit more pure, uh, even though there is this understanding. Like, yeah, this shit is fake. It's not real. You know, th- this this head is coming out of this part of the body. But e- the the only part for me that I found that was comical, you know, looking at it, uh, what are we thirty seven years on, uh, thirty eight years on, was when the doctor is is using the defibrillator defibrillator machine. And he goes to that last clear, the chest opens up and then bites his hands off. And in that part, I'm like, it looks like a fucking Muppet. It looks like a Muppet has just opened up and ate his hands. Uh, but other than that, I mean, er- everything else for me is still had that feeling of, okay, yeah, if I saw this in person, it might freak me out. It might be weird. As opposed to... The first time I saw that as well, though, because yeah. when you know it's coming, you can see how cheesy it is. But that first time you see that movie, you know something's going to go on because the tension is so built. Mm-hmm. And then something, something just so gonzo out of nowhere that the guy literally turns into a huge mouth that opens and bites his arms <laughs> off. I mean, I remember the first time we saw that, me and a bunch of mates sitting around the first time. Everybody's like sitting back in their chair like, whoa! So, you know, it had the desired effect when it was fresh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and I didn't even think that it really pulled me out that much now. Like... Even the stuff that wasn't totally up to speed <laughs> as far as special effects go, like it didn't make me like sit there going, "That's fake looking." Like I still had that tension and that fear and that, you know, the everything that we watch horror for. <laughs> so I was really impressed with how that helped. Bearing in mind that a, a lot of that comes down to just the incredible cast in this movie. Like everybody turns in just such an astounding performance, regardless of what's happening in the story or what's happening in the effects. Every single person in that film absolutely sells the film. Oh, yeah. Even the Norwegian guy at the beginning. Like, he's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And uh, did you guys know that that he literally tells them that this dog is evil and to get away from it in Norwegian? So, like, if you went to this film and spoke Norwegian, you'd, you'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah, spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, because at at the beginning, when you see the dog getting chased and shot at, you're kind of like, what the fuck? You know, because, what you know, there's that rule about you're not supposed to kill the dog in a movie. But you have (laughs) you have that first indication that, you know, the the dog, there's something wrong here when these guys are chasing down, not a wolf, a fucking dog. It's a Siberian Husky uh, that they're chasing. And when the when the the uh, the other scientists are from the other station are telling him, hey, you know, (laughs) You might want to kill that thing because it's evil is going to get you. Um, it does clear up for us, at least if you do have the translation or at least read the spoiler about it, that, yeah, you probably should just go ahead and kill that one dog just to go ahead and stop whatever this is from spreading because he's not just doing this for the fun of it. Uh, you know, he's he's not, you know, related to any Trumps or anything. It's, it's like a Star Wars, um, like, trash ejection moment, isn't it? It's like, yeah. We talked about the fact that in Star Wars, if that guy watching the trash get ejected had actually gone, actually, there's a problem there and like shot, killed the droids. And that would have been it. Everything would have been finished. The entire film hinges on that one guy not noticing mm-hmm. that the droid being ejected at the start of the movie. And this is the same thing. If one of those people in that station spoke Norwegian, they would have just flamed the shit out of that dog. And that would have been, no, no, you know, threat, threat neutralized. No problem. It'd be a really short movie. Yeah. <laughs> So Carpenter is, of course, one of the gods when it comes to social commentary. Uh, When we started this podcast, I insisted on starting with They Live because that's that's the one that did it for me. Right. So where where would you guys like to start? Alan, I'll let you start since uh, you're the guest here. But like, what's the big social commentary for you? Um, Well, I think it comes this film sort of approaches it like a few different things, but I think I think one of the main kind of points that it keeps asking is this um, understanding of of self and this loss of self and and who are we and who can you trust because mm-hmm. at, you know at, right through from the very start of the film right to the very end the constant theme is whether you know who someone really is are they really what they appear to be or are they actually a horrendous monster intent on assimilating and killing everything. Um, so regardless of the action and everything else, that's the question that keeps being asked. Um, and, you know, would you know any different? Like when um, uh, when when Wilford Brimley's character is, is in the shed and it all seems um, 
you know, he's constantly protesting his innocence when they finally track it down and find that he's been slowly building an escape spaceship under the <laughs> ice. It's, it's just, it's mind blowing. You know, so like, dude, this is fantastic because throughout until that point, you just never could be sure whether he was, whether he was genuinely telling the truth or not. And so, and, and right through to the very end scene, um, you know, with McCready and Charles at the end, you just don't, you, you still don't know. And so that's the question that it's always asking, I think. And that's, that for me, that's the thing that makes it just so horrendous is that you could be just sitting there and you just don't know. And it also then sort of asked a question, well, do the, do the people themselves know? Is it possible that they can be affected by this creature but still be themselves mm. and, and not know until it takes over? Right. Um, and can you, even, can you even trust yourself that you are yourself still or not? So, yeah, for me, that's the overriding, uh, the overriding theme throughout. Absolutely. Don? Yeah, I, I, I wrote down a few things, and, and for me, it always comes down to, uh, with films like this, the, the comparison with things like um, the, the Red Scare with zombie films and, and this idea of, uh, kind of like what you just brought up, that idea of does the person who is infected or affected by the monster have any control once they know? You know, it's kind of like when we look at some of the some of the zombie films, those guys who know they're infected are either two and doing two things. They're either trying to convince everybody else that they're not infected and that they're OK. Or you have those those few characters that realize, oh, shit, I better do something about this before I hurt somebody else. Because uh, I know on Return of the Living Dead, you know, this the, the two main characters from the beginning, the one guy is getting sick and they finally, you know. Uh, it succumbs to the the zombie, you know, plague or whatever it is. But then the guy he's working with, the older gentleman, realizes things are going to get bad, and he puts himself in a, in uh, the the uh, cremation furnace and burns himself alive because he doesn't want to become a zombie and hurt anybody. Um, so you know it, that is a good question to ask: is is can you not only trust somebody else to be who they say they are, but can you trust yourself in that situation, or at least know yourself well enough? Once you get to that situation where you might be infected, uh, or at least the 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 monster, alien, whatever it is that's taking over your body, uh, you still can exert some control to stop them, or you know, you know, reject the parasite that's that's using it you as its host. So one of the things I saw, I watched an interview with Carpenter, and he was saying that there was a lot of talk on on set of whether you would know that you'd been infected with the thing. Mm. And I thought that was really cool that it hadn't been decided going into it. And, you know, it's not even necessarily explored. It's, it's sort of explored, but you know what I mean? Uh, that scene where they're doing the blood samples mm -hmm. and you can tell that some of them don't know, right? Like clearly that makes you human. I don't know when you're a monster, if you would know, but like the humans are sitting there and they're legitimately waiting for the reaction to find out. And that really struck me because I'm, I'm just going to go anti Donald Trump. Like I always do here, but uh, I've been noticing a lot of people who don't seem to know that they're the monster. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it seems to be a continuing trend going on in the world around me right now. And, uh, and I just, I find that fascinating how, I, I don't know if that's what Carpenter was shooting for, but it's a really interesting social commentary at the same time, whether it was the eighties, whether it was 1951 when the, what is it? The thing from outer space? Is that what it was called that they mm. based this off of when that came out, you know, the fifties, even 2011, it was still, there's always questions of people around you and who's the monster and I really like that aspect of, am I the monster and I don't know it? I thought well, yeah, that was those, really cool. Those 50s ones were heavily about uh, anti-communism and anti-communist propaganda. So it, it, it would make sense that Carpenter would pick up on that, but not necessarily the, the anti-communism side, but the, the idea of, are you what you claim to be? You know, this, this person who's... You know, we're talking about the 1980s. That's the early part of that excess, the, at least the earlier part of the 1980s, where we're talking about excess. And uh, before uh, Reagan starts really pumping into his whole idea about, you know, American exceptionalism and, and anti-communism and, you know, the eventual fall of the Berlin Wall and fall of the Soviet Union. 
But even during that early part of the 1980s, it seemed like we returned to the 1950s with this idea of us versus them. And I have to prove how much of us I am or else I'm going to get uh, labeled as them. So I've got to do all this shit the right way so that you can trust me to know that I'm not one of them. And so that's what I got a lot out of this this film was, you know, whether it was the blood test or, hey, man, trust me, I'm you know, I've got I've got no reason to do this. Or, hey, I found these clothes out there and I said, fuck it. I cut him, cut his line because <laughs> I'm not bringing him back here. And then Kurt Russell is now suspicious of, I forgot the guy's his name in real life as well as the film, where he comes back and he's like, you fucking cut me. And, and he comes back with the dynamite and he's like, I will blow all of us the fuck up because, you know, if, if <laughs> we're going to figure out what the hell's going on here. To the point, you know, so many people are insecure and suspicious of, of one another that they can't have that sense of normalcy. And that's what I remember about living in the United States and, and you know, even in the 80s with the whole idea of uh, being concerned about, you know, oh, you know, could your neighbors possibly be communists? Do you think this is going to work? How is this going to happen? What, what do you think they might be trying to get over on you? Because even in the election now, you know, you already have seen this, this big attack on anything that can be deemed as socialism or socialist leaning or possibly communist or anything like that. And the people who are trying to, you know, label things don't even understand what those things are. There's a, there's a rule sort of in writing or not really a rule, but there's a, this idea in writing stories that when you have your antagonists and your villains and whatever, that it, obviously it's really important that they're as well-developed characters as the protagonists or something. You don't want these like cardboard cutout villains just for, as a foil. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the best things to sort of keep in mind when you're writing characters like that is that they're always, they're always motivated and they believe in what they're doing and they believe that they're doing the right thing. Right. But there are, there are sort of two sides to that. There are, some, there are some people who believe in what they're doing even though they know they're technically the bad guy and they don't give a shit. Or there are the people who believe in what they're doing and think that everyone else is so stupid that they don't get it when um, it's so obvious to them what the truth is. And that kind of ambiguity is what always makes for the best sort of interplay between characters especially so if you've got a bad guy and a good guy in the movie and the people watching the movie are pretty well aware um of wh what side people lie on if there's an ambiguity to the motivations of those people mm -hmm. that can be really compelling which is why anti-heroes are so good for the same reason if the bad guy believes he's actually the good guy then it makes for a powerful character and if the good guy sometimes does morally questionable things um and is something of an anti-hero but for the greater good that also makes things more interesting um, and with a movie like this, with the thing, you end up in a situation where everybody is kind of both those things. It's like it's like Schrodinger's villain. You don't really know whether they are a good guy, whether they're a monster and they know it, or whether they're a monster and they don't know it. And so, and, and that's I think that's one of the things that keeps that incredible tension throughout the film because they don't know, we don't know, and so you're just constantly waiting to see which person is just suddenly going to burst into you know, tentacles and violence and spurting blood because it could happen to any of them at any time, right. whether they know it or not. And, so, and that's kind of like, uh, it's like a focused lens on that idea that anybody could be a communist. They could suddenly do something really communist next door or they could, you know, it, you don't know at what point it's suddenly going to manifest and become a, a genuine problem. Well, and that goes into like serial killers and all that kind of stuff for me too. Like you look at like uh, the BTK killer, who was just this normal guy, right? And his, even his wife didn't know that he'd been killing all these women. And and I really get that same kind of feeling from uh, Wilford Brimley's character of just the, no, I'm, I'm fine. There's right. nothing wrong with me. Let me back in. And then you find out he's doing all this stuff, like you guys said. But that's the same feeling that I get from... Like, is your neighbor a killer? Is the guy down the street a child molester? You know, like, I find that just absolutely fascinating. And I don't see a lot of representation for that feeling in movies. When you do, it's it's not as ambiguous. Like, you kind of know, and then you're scared for characters. But I, that's something I'd really like to see more writers follow up on. I, well, I think that's what makes the thing so powerful. Sorry, mm -hmm. go on. Oh, no. I was going to say, when you brought up Wilford Brimley, the thing that got me uh, was that he he makes this, this comment at one point where it says, I don't know who to trust. And at that point, I'm like, oh, shit. 
it can't be the old man, but no, maybe it is him <laughs> because it, you know, Carpenter does suck you in that way because you make the, you make him so sympathetic where he's by himself, and the next time Kurt Russell checks in on him, he's in there eating beans out of a can. Yep, <laughs> and you're sitting there like, you know what? That's completely fucking normal. I'm isolated and depressed behavior. Like, fuck it, <laughs> I'm just gonna open this up and eat it. These sons of bitches aren't gonna let me in. And then he kind of gives him this sad puppy dog look where he's kind of like, well, you know, this is just the way to, yeah, I'm not infected, man. I don't know what to tell you. And it makes you question, like, what would I say at that same time to prove to somebody that I'm not who they're looking for? And it, it's it, it comes back down to things like game theory. You've got three people in a room. One person dies and one person is killed. Which one of those two people did it? Because one of them definitely did murder that third person. And they're both saying the other one did it. Like, and, and they've got to come up with all these ways to let you know that they're not the ones who did it. And, and that's what I got from Wilford Brimley. I'm like, shit, he's convincing me. But I, in the back of my head, I'm thinking like, no, this is the bad guy. You know, he's one of the people <laughs> who's infected. But that sad fucking look just got me. I'm like, I just don't know who to trust. I'm like, oh, you can shit. take it. <laughs> you can take it back to Donald Trump again. You you, you find, you know, there's uh, there's always a Donald Trump tweet for pretty much everything because oh yeah, you know, he's basically always talking about himself. So when he's talking about these awful, heinous, ridiculous things that Obama was going to do or whatever, he's always talking about himself. He's mm -hmm. always projecting his own ideas onto other people. He tells some, you know, he goes on about someone having a nervous fit and getting angry, and it's like you know damn well he's the one freaking out and getting angry. Um, and, and that's a lot of the time, that's how this kind of um, sociopathic mindset, or in this case, this kind of alien monster infected mindset would operate. That's how you sow that sort of dissent is that you always point out what's clearly wrong with the other people. And you know so well what's clearly wrong with them, because either consciously or subconsciously, it's you. And so, you know, damn well, like just he was like people are always sh sharing at the moment these uh, screenshots of Trump tweets talking about how. You can guarantee Obama is going to start a war in Iran to make sure he gets elected for a second term. Yeah, right. uh, which is you know terrifyingly fucking relevant right now because you know the dickhead just murdered the second most important person in Iran. Mm -hmm. So he's talking, he's always projecting, and and in the terms of like the thing and these sorts of monsters like that, that that's you can't. This, the thing is that you can't tell because you don't know when they're projecting and when they're actually just sort of talking regularly. But that's how it works so pervasively is that if someone knows something so well, because even subconsciously it's them and their thought process, when they're talking about these things, it makes it incredibly convincing, which is what makes it so convincing when um, Blair is in his shed and looking so sort of forlorn and saying, you've got to trust me, guys. It's not me. It's those guys you've got to think about. What about so-and-so? You should be looking at him real closely. Um and again, we get back to that point. Does he know he's the monster or does he genuinely believe he's not? Or is he the monsters doing that sort of talking about himself, playing thing to, to undermine confidence? So that's what makes this film so powerful is that the, the ambiguity persists throughout. Even by the end, we don't know how many people knew or didn't know what they were. Well, I mean, you would have to think that in building this this UFO thing, in the uh, basement, for lack of a better term. Uh, I would like to know how that works if he doesn't know. Like, does he black out and work on it? Exactly. And then, like, yeah. you know? But this is I don't know. The alien could take over his mind to be doing stuff when he sleeps or, or you know, like, literally, like you say, just sort of blanking him out and, and doing stuff. His conscious mm -hmm. mind could be completely unaware of what he's doing all this time. I find that fascinating. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, another thing that Carpenter said was his exact quote is the paranoia is the glue that holds the movie together. <laughs> and I can't even think of a better summary for this film. <laughs> like That sums it all up so well. And rewatching it now, like I was really acutely aware of how well each actor did paranoia, but did it slightly differently. Because none of us react the same way to things, right? And I find that sometimes in films, characters all react the same way or a similar way. 
And so that's that's another writing thing I want to throw out there for people. Make sure your characters, they can be experiencing the exact same thing and having a similar reaction, but they're still going to do it differently because they're all different people. And I just, I thought it was great how they did it in this. But also, I just really wanted to share that quote. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a good quote. It is, it makes, um, like, and it is important to differentiate, <clears throat> excuse me, to differentiate that that manifestation of paranoia because some people are really calm you, you look at people like you know mccready's character he's the calm collected one for most of it and you know on loses his shit on occasional moments but otherwise mm-hmm. tries to stay basically calm and focused whereas other people just vibe on the energy of continuously losing their shit um and and that is a good example of the types of people that you will get because people do react differently and those reactions then it's it's kind of like a self-perpetuating machine because those reactions then fuel further reactions. Like on McCready's case, why the fuck are you so calm, man? What do you know? And, you know, the people that are more hectic, you need to calm down. You're driving everybody mad. So, you right. know, like those reactions further fuel reactions like them. And that, and that becomes this kind of perpetual motion machine of paranoia. So, yeah. Don, what do you got in your notes? Well, no, no, I had the paranoia piece because that that's what – I'm glad that you pulled the quote about the, the glue that's holding it all together because that's what kept me, uh, you know, uh, honed in on this film because I was thinking, one, about how fearful all these men would be in that situation. But also, with, as you and I have talked about with previous films, what would I be thinking in the same type of situation? What would I be worried about? What would I be concerned about? And, you know, it, it's one of those things where – you can't be so paranoid to where you go off on your own and say, hey, fuck all you guys. I don't trust any of you. I'm going to go do my own shit because then the focus is going to be on you as to why are you trying to go off by yourself and do something? And then you end up, you know, tied to furniture or, <laughs> or a pipe or something. And you know, that's, you know, even Keith David's character when he's like, are you fucking crazy? You're not tying me up. What is going I'm sitting there like, it ain't him. It ain't him because that's the appropriate response. It's like you ain't fucking tie me up, and then he's kind of like, ah, oh, shit. Well, if you're really gonna fucking kill me, then go ahead and tie me up because I, you know, I, I'm gonna prove that I'm not him one way or the other, uh, or it one way or the other. Um, you know, one of the but, best things about that scene as well is uh-huh. that when they finally do get a positive result and they're all freaking out and go, shit, untie me, untie me, get me away from this thing. There are people that hadn't been tested yet, and they think they found the, dude, the 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 monster. But it's like, well, right. there could be more one of them as well, which is one of the things I found. The I remember being, you know, in the first times watching this, going, "Fucking test the others, quick, test the others." <laughs> because, yeah. <laughs> this is that one, but then what about those two you didn't get to yet? So, yeah, even the tests and, make you more paranoid. You know, and he makes such a pageantry of the testing instead of just like just do the others and find out. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. Man, I do like one of the scenes that way. <laughs> that is one of the greatest scenes in cinema, I think. The way that that's built, and they've got this really sort of simple test, and the real close ups on the copper wire, and that like noise it makes as it scrapes oh, yeah. on the glass, and, and nothing happens to the blood, just hisses. And this, there's this sort of the cinematography and the sound that they use in that scene is just is so powerful. It's very, very cool. Well, and it's cool also how uh, just the the instant reaction when there is a positive test like that yeah. horror <laughs> kicks in hardcore that's yeah. so great and then and the flame throw doesn't, doesn't trigger and he's <laughs> he's trying trying to get that fucking thing to to flame on and yeah <laughs> and i love the last line the uh cuz i don't want to be tied to a fucking couch for the rest of my life or whatever that is <laughs> love that line but yeah uh so One of the things that I read, I don't know how I feel about this, but there's some talk that this was like Carpenter also like looking at the AIDS epidemic and all this stuff. The reason that doesn't work for me is that the AIDS epidemic really kicked off in like 81 and this came out in 82. So that seems really freaking fast to me. But I I, that's that's retro, um, retro justification, I think, because, um, um, apart from anything else, if Carpenter was making a commentary along those sort of lines, he would have done a much better job of it in terms of of referencing AIDS than he did. It, it's one of those things that's been shoehorned into, uh, yeah, sort of 
like a post explanation i think i don't buy that at all yeah and the thing i do like about it i like how social commentary is always changing things always reflect where we're mindset where our mindset is you know so mm. i i do like when things get retroactive like that but yeah i just think it was way too fast uh but they were like oh you know there's blood testing and <laughs> all these other things and then the 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 big evidence was there's no females anywhere and at the time the aids epidemic was all gay people and i'm like you're really stretching hard for this now like you know yeah. like there's Let me ask you, the- how many women would have been on this expedition? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. But, no, I just, uh, I was curious how you guys felt about things, like like social commentary changing over the years, so to speak, like this. Like, well, do you like, think, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, it's just like Wizard of Oz, okay? Now, bear with me, James. Whether you're talking about the Frank L. Baum book about populism or talking about the play or even the film that comes out in 36, depending on where you are, and this is this is true for any film that where you have a lot of social commentary, you can throw in modern times or uh, or any other uh, other films that that aren't necessarily horror. Um, Whatever the social issues that are being discussed in those films or being represented through metaphors, another generation can look at it and say, Oh, that's this being represented in the film with, you know, the the yellow brick road or the the when Charlie Chaplin gets locked it falls into the gears of the machine, and I think this is one of those films as well because when you when you mention AIDS, that was the thing that that stood out to me. But I'm like, it's '82. It was still being referred to as Grid at the time. It wasn't AIDS yet, and even at that time, people were so confused as to what it was. You know, it wasn't until like 84, 85, there was really a grasp on it. And there was really this attempt for uh, people to focus in on this was a disease that wasn't uh, just associated with, you know, at the time, uh, Haitian refugees, hemophiliacs and the the gay community. You know, people started to realize, like, it's it's about more than that. It's not them. And it's not just IV drug users. And uh, you can't get it from kissing someone or sitting on a toilet seat. And so I think that, that looking at it from the lens of paranoia, you can understand it a lot better, even if you do think about it with, with it being AIDS. But, you know, what, what Carpenter's saying, or at least what he's representing, is, is, is things prior to that period when we did get consumed with the AIDS crisis. Now, those afterwards are going to see it, um, especially with the, the, the blood testing itself. It's hard to avoid that. Um, Thinking about the, the the blood infections or thinking about uh, HIV and AIDS as, as far as being these things where people would try and convince others like, no, I'm safe. We don't need to wear a condom. I'm clean. You know, those types of uh, arguments that people would when we talked about sex ed the other day, uh, those arguments that people would have to argue against using any type of protection, uh, because if you can't trust me, who can you trust? Wow! Yeah, that's man. Did you know, it's uh, I read a I read a, a trivia piece that said that when uh, Carpenter was sort of sold on making the film after reading scripts and stuff, he was sold on making the film based on the blood test scene. That was the that was the sort of pivot around which he was convinced that it was going to be a good film. So mm-hmm. nice, yeah, and it, no. and it works in the film because. And it's even one of these weird things that you got to think about with respect to blood. Uh, I don't know if either one of you ever watched Dexter, but one of Dexter's yeah. famous, you know, uh, quotes that he always used all the time is like, blood doesn't lie. And as I'm watching this, it's like, you're doing the blood test to determine, and blood tests can be used for so many things. And I like the fact that they're using it to determine if somebody's an alien or a monster, this one. But you'd use blood yeah. to determine whether, you know, what diseases somebody has or what their 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 red blood cell count is, you know, determine their overall health determine you know things like the cholesterol level that you have your a1c you know there's so many things that are going on in your blood that can tell you what somebody's health is like um but just just the idea that hey we're going to determine whether or not you're an alien blood all looks the same on the outside but once we test it with with you know whatever these crude measures are we can determine whether you're good or bad or whether you're one of us um and even to go so far as you know being raised as a kid they would always have that stupid Stupid, stupid, stupid saying, which I'm sure is going to start coming back now. 
I'm a red blooded American. <laughs> like yeah, blood is every red everywhere. human being on earth <laughs> is red blooded. Yeah. And so for me, I'm like, it doesn't make sense. So it's it's one of those things of, you know, can you prove your your loyalty in your blood? And I guess that's really what it comes down to with that 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 uh you know with that blood test is determining, you know, who's safe or at least who can be trusted. But um, you know. Well, that, I mean that's the blood, blood test. Yeah, that blood is the great spider. Like you can't hide. It's it, at some level. The closer you look at blood, the more you learn about things. Um, like Barker said, we're you know we're all red inside. Everyone is a book of blood. It, it determines. It, we're fascinated with it because it's obviously so essential to life. It's what comes out when you're hurt, and if you look closely enough, it pretty much tells you everything you need to know about a person or anything you need to learn mm-hmm. about a person. You can learn from their blood. So. Yeah, it's, it's one of those kind of, it, it's irrefutable at some level. And, you know, it's very simple in a way that you put a hot copper wire into some blood because, you know, that's a really blatant and dramatic way to have that scene work so well. <laughs> but, you know, you can put a drop of blood under a microscope and if you look closely enough, you can see inside that person and you can see what's going on. So, yeah, it's regardless of how you present yourself or what you try to convince people of if you if they get a chance to look closely at your blood you can't hide so alan do you have any other social commentary aspects of this film that you really dig um well i think it's sort of um in some ways it's second not well it is secondary but um, only because there's a massive alien monster like turning people into <laughs> tentacles. Um, but I hate it, it when it, that happens. Right? I mean, it just takes over everything. But um, there is also, this this film would have been so different if they'd have um, dug up this spaceship while doing uh, foundations for a building in New York City, for example. You know, like, the, the fact that it's so isolated um, is the only way that makes this work. If, they, if that alien had been dug up and really obviously it was frozen in um in deep ice which is why it was inactive until it got revealed so that's the only reason it hadn't taken over the world by now but if it had been in any anywhere sort of even slightly more populated with any kind of transportation routes it would have spread so fast and virulently um that uh that this the isolation is a very um focal point of how everything worked right till the end when they're basically left with just McCready and Child sitting there, neither knowing which one is or isn't infected, but they're still on their own out there, knowing that at some point somebody is going to come and investigate what happened because they lost touch with this, this particular base. Um, and so I think a lot of the commentary sort of under the surface of this film is talking about isolation and working in a small team and people having to get on in a situation where they rely entirely on each other because nobody on their own out there could really manage to survive. It has to be a team effort, but you're a team that's otherwise completely isolated. Any kind of help or assistance is, is a long way off. So I think that it explores, you know, it sort of obliquely explores those sorts of themes as well, which I find quite interesting. The isolation for me is one of the things that makes this film terrifying because mm-hmm. I would not survive anywhere. Like I'm surprised I survive here. So <laughs> I, I couldn't make a fire. I couldn't find food. Like I would be screwed. So that's always like absolutely terrifying to me. And then so this film. In, in Antarctic, you wouldn't be able to find food or make a fire either. There's a distinct lack of animals and trees there. <laughs> It's a fine point you make, but, uh, like I, I just, I think it's so interesting how adding where it is makes it worse to me. Like isolation freaks me out if it's a forest, right? Like if I'm alone, I'm still always like super jumpy. Uh, but you add in like, these guys are in literally the middle of nowhere with nowhere to go. And so even if you wanted to leave, you, you couldn't. You know, like McCready can't be that far away when he gets cut loose. And I just, I don't know. This film terrifies the shit out of me in that aspect way more than the alien does. So, yeah. What about you, Don? How do you feel about the isolation? Isolation. 
Here's what got me with this film. It wasn't necessarily isolation. It was isolation plus the darkness. Ooh. So early on, you know, they're, they're in this remote station all together. And I even thought about that, that goofy insurance commercial or whatever it was where the, it, is, it basically looks just like the thing, but an updated version where these guys are in their research station at the South Pole and, or in, the, in, the Antar- in, in Antarctica. And the one of the guys has a karaoke machine and just keeps singing Backstreet Boy songs. And the one guy's like, fuck it, I'm out, and opens the door <laughs> to go out into the blizzard. Um, so for me, it's like when it was daytime and they're by themselves and they're trying to figure out what's going on, not really an issue for me. It's not one of those things that's too fearful. But you add the darkness into it to where they're isolated and it's dark all around. I think uh, Kurt Russell's character was even saying, hey, there's going to be a storm. There's a storm on its way. That's when, for me, the tension rises because now it's that idea of you can't see as much. So, you know, forget just the, the idea that this monster's out there. It was one thing in the daylight where he was, you know, possibly there. You could see him, you know, that the one guy pulled out a six shooter, you know, while it was still daylight out. And he was shooting at stuff. But being there in that remote station where you're where you're isolated now, it's down to what two, three people. And now it's dark aside from the fire. And they even make that comment of like, hey, the fire is going to raise the temperature somewhat up here, you know, let, let, letting them know that, hey, we're going to be warm for a little bit. And then you get hit with a, well, it's not going to last. So now what do we have to, you know, you got to wait out the storm. You got to hopefully survive the night. Maybe the, the thing has died in the fire. Um, so there's that uncertainty of, I don't know if it's still out there. It's dark. I can't see it. And I've got to battle these elements as well. Um, yeah, because I can be in a place by myself. Um, but if you change certain things, like where it's daytime, I'm, I'm in my house by myself, fine. Then it comes nighttime, I'm still in the house by myself, I'm still okay. But if if the same noises I hear in the daytime, I hear it at night, not going to feel the same way about those noises. It's a, it's a regular conceit in storytelling to uh, to constantly sort of level up those pressures. Mm-hmm. So it, it's done brilliantly in this film because in the first instance, they're in an Antarctic station. So they're isolated and relying on each other. Um, and next thing, the, uh, all, the, all the vehicles are trashed so they can't get anywhere. Um, then communications are trash. They can't contact anyone. Then it gets dark. They can't see anything. And then there's a storm. It's even worse. You know, it's like, it's, it's like the, the, you constantly level up the pressures against these characters. So anything that stays the same for too long starts to become a bit sort of dull. So, you know, it's, it's always that, that method in storytelling where you have a situation that gets consistently worse while your characters are trying, trying to deal with it. And so, that, you know, they have to constantly level up their response to a situation that's getting consistently worse. If the situation sort of stays the same throughout, the story can, can be stale. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interestingly done. And it, in some ways, it's difficult. Like, well, they're on their own in an, in an Antarctic station. How the fuck can it get worse? It's like, well, you... you start taking out the few life support things that they've got going on, you know, step by step until they're left sitting around a bonfire that's eventually going to burn out and they're going to freeze. And if nothing else, if the alien is still alive, it's just going to freeze again and it's all going to just sit there and wait. And then eventually someone's going to turn up to check what happened to this base and right. the whole thing starts over again. But the alien at this point now has learned a bit about people. It's been other people and it's going to be like, okay, well, might be a bit more subtle about its approach next time and sneak off with the rescue party and then start to manifest or whatever you know it's, yeah there's something else i wanted to talk about i don't know if you guys are aware of this but uh, peter watts um he's a canadian science fiction author at, for anybody who doesn't know just unfuck that he's just absolutely astounding <laughs> um author as far as i'm concerned the absolute seminal first contact novel uh, is blind sight written written by him it's just outstanding um but he had a short story published in Clark's World some time ago, um, which is ba- I can't remember actually what what the title of the story is, but it's something based. But it's basically the thing that from this version of the movie, uh, but it's a story told from the alien's point of view, um, and it's just it's a really incredible <laughs> piece of narrative work. I, so I don't really want to talk about it too much in terms of spoiling it, but I'll just to say that for people who who dig this movie. Um, and the ideas behind it and, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about and motivations and who knows what, 
Um, that story by Watts is just is just outstanding. It's really, really cleverly done. So I, I really recommend people read it. Nice. That sounds it's, amazing. It's a hugs world. It's easy to find online as well. That's the other beauty of, uh, of, of good online magazines like that. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> There's so silence as people keep quickly tap in to the typical look up Peter Watts, you'll find it. Typical uh people today, right? We all just get distracted and go look something up on the internet. So <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna love has... this. The title is the yeah. things plural. That's, yeah. Yeah. Some friends of mine have this uh, thing they call the specularity where if something comes up in conversation and normally someone would reach for a phone to look it up, as soon as that situation arises, they all go, okay, specularity, and they all talk around a thing <laughs> and they figure out what, what they think is the, the definitive answer until they, they speculate until they get to the finest point of speculation, which is the specularity, and then they look it up, which I think is kind of a fun way to, to deal with the fact that information is at our fingertips these days. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so I have the link to the the story you were just talking about. So I'm going to put it on our social media so people can check it out as well. Yeah, and and do check out anything by by Peter Watts. He's he's one of the nicest guys. And on just as a, uh, a slight aside, um, if you're not too squeamish, a few years ago he got uh, necrotizing fasciitis um, on his leg, and uh, his his leg just basically started rotting and had to be treated. And uh, he he documented. The whole thing in photo essays on his blog, which uh, if you have the stomach for it, is actually an incredibly interesting um, yeah, uh, process of what was going on there. So that, that's worth looking at. The man is uh, a scientist by trade. He's a biologist originally, and he's an outstanding writer, and his work is fantastic. He won a Hugo uh, for a novella called The Island, which, again, is just a, a mind-blowing piece of work. So I, I yeah, can't recommend his stuff highly enough. Hmm. I mean, I don't want to sound too excited to go check out this blog post because that seems rude, but but I'm pretty excited to go check this out now. So thank you for sharing yeah, that. Yeah. His, his website is because he wrote, his, I think his first novel, don't, don't quote me on this, but I think his first novel was Starfish, which again is an amazing, an amazing novel. Um, and it was about these, it, so basically it was the Rifters trilogy. And so his, I think his website is the, the rifters.com or rifters.com or something like that. And his blog is on there. Nice. You can just search up his name, obviously, to find it. But uh, yeah, he's a he's a really nice guy, a really fascinating guy. Very cool. Uh, so I want to talk about the end real fast. Yeah, one of the things, gotta... <laughs> one of the things I love most about horror is it's the one genre that likes to leave questions, and this film does it spectacularly because there's the question: Is McCready the the thing is child's the thing is anyone the thing are they both the thing does it matter and then you add in the whole if i was a perfect imitation would i know so like there's so many multiple levels to that question of whether either one is the thing at the end what do you guys feel about this like do you do you have an answer that's canon to you or do you like the ambiguity or what all right this is well, that's be really what i love about it yeah, the, the thing I love about this film is that it opens with a question and it closes with the same question. And it, throughout everything that's happened, they're like we don't know any different, neither do they, neither, neither does anyone else. Like They go through all this stuff. They learn, in some ways, they learn what this thing is, where it came from, what it can do and everything else. And at the end of it, we still don't know if it's there or if it's not, or if it's them or if it's not, or if it's going to be able to travel or if it can't. We, we, we still just don't know. Um, and so, so that ambiguity I love, and I, we, me and friends have sort of talked about this at great length. I've got some friends absolutely convinced that McCready is the thing and Childs isn't at the end. And I've got friends equally convinced it's the other way around. So, <laughs> you know, plus you can, plus you can add in, as you mentioned, that they both are, or they both aren't. And on top of all that, does it even matter? Because surely regardless of what happened and all the experience 